Hello, everyone. Welcome to Credential Up Houston, a show that focuses on the power, the influence, the opportunity, and yes, even the wealth that can come from credentialing up. Our show today focuses on homeschooling. According to the 2017-2018 data from the National Center for Education Statistics, there are approximately 1,770,000 children being homeschooled in the United States. This is a growing population of homeschool graduates who will become a vital part of the socioeconomic fabric of our country. Today we will learn more about the growing population of homeschooled children in Texas, their academic achievements, and their academic pursuits upon high school completion. Joining us today are Mr. Tim Lambert, who is in charge of the Texas Homeschool Coalition in the state of Texas, and of course, Mr. Jeremy Newman, who is the policy director. We thank you both so very, very much for joining us. Uh, and of course, this was not an easy drive today from where you were previously. Uh, Mr. Lambert, you come to us from Pennsylvania via New York and yes. Mr. Newman from Dallas. So we thank you both very much for coming in to be on our program today to talk about homeschooling. So give us the history of homeschooling in the state of Texas. Well, Please, uh, Dr. Ford, homeschooling uh, began in the modern era in the late 1960s and 70s uh, in Texas in the 1980s. Uh, homeschooling began in earnest and we began to see uh, actually the state of Texas considered homeschooling illegal. So the state was prosecuting homeschoolers in the 1980s. Our organization began in response to that in 1986 and there was a class action suit against the state uh, that finally came to fruition in 1994 when the Texas Supreme Court ruled that homeschools were private schools. And uh, so we've been um, uh, growing dramatically ever since that time. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that case was the Leaper versus Arlington Independent School District. Is that, that correct? That is correct. So tell us just a bit about that. So there was a, the state, uh, the Texas Education Agency ruled uh, or gave direction to public schools in the 1980s that homeschooling was not legal. And so they began, be, began to encourage the local school districts to uh, prosecute uh, homeschoolers under the compulsory attendance statute. So the argument from the TEA was that homeschools are not private schools and therefore their students are not exempt from the compulsory attendance statute. And uh, we won the lower court decision in Arlington uh, in 1987. And uh, the state appealed that and appealed it again and the uh, state ruled in our, on our, in our favor in 1994. And in the state of Texas, of course, you are the director, but also this is the largest coalition in the country, I understand. That's correct. We're one of the, and of course, most Texans would not be surprised, we're one of the largest and best <laughs> uh, homeschool groups in the country. I see. Very, very good. And so, Mr. Newman, you, of course, uh, you know, with a very, very successful homeschooling background. So tell us about your experience being homeschooled. Sure. I mean, it was, it was definitely a positive thing for me. And I was one of six kids growing up and all of us were homeschooled. And so it was, I mean, it was, it was still in some ways a, a new thing at that time. Um, but it was, it was definitely more normalized than you know, some of the history that, that Tim was talking about. And so, I mean, one of the experiences that you'll recognize when you're being homeschooled is the vast differences between the ways that all the homeschooling families do it and all the different methods there are available, all the different options there are. And you know, that's, that's come about over the process of several decades where it's become more normalized and, and more options have become available and the network has become more connected. And so for us, it was, that was normal, you know, being homeschooled. And so, you know, we would wake up every morning and start our classes early in the morning and we would have a checklist of things we had to do. And, you know, you get it done early, you're done for the day. Or you, you know, take longer and, you know, have less play time. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, what was your normal day like as a homeschool uh, young person? And, of course, you just explained that. So when was your play time, for example, in integrated into that? So, I mean, traditionally in the evening, like, like you would expect, but we also, I mean, a lot of families do it this way, actually, where we didn't follow strictly the traditional semester where you take off in the summer and then you spend the first three or four weeks of each semester catching up for everything you forgot from the previous semester. And so we kind of did school year round. 
and that gave us uh, enough flexibility that you know, if we had to take days off to go do something as a family here or there, we were able to do that because we were doing school be between semesters as well. And uh, so I definitely appreciated that aspect of it. It gave us a lot more flexibility, not, not just logistically, but in the types of activities that we were able to participate in. Very, very good. And so let's talk briefly about your experience at the conference that you attended in Pennsylvania. What were some of the major issues that were addressed or policy initiatives that are being pursued? Well, we go to this uh, national meeting every year. It's just an association of state leaders, and we get together and we share what's going on in our state. Uh, we talk about best practices, what's working for us. We do talk a lot about policy issues. Uh, we have friends from high regulation states like New York and Pennsylvania, as, and then as well as uh, low regulation states like Texas and Oklahoma. So we are seeing uh, uh, a kind of a renewed uh, opposition to homeschooling and uh, some of the new stories that focus on uh, negative situations with some homeschool families. So we talked about how to address those issues and, and push back. So there's, from the 1980s until the early 2000s, the, the, the trend was to give parents more and more freedom in terms of choices on how they do things. And of course in Texas, because Texas doesn't regulate private education, uh, parents here have dramatic freedom to choose what is best for their children. But, but all states are not that uh, progressive Certainly. Uh, from that standpoint. So we talk about a lot of those things. And a lot of those uh, organizations look to Texas because of our success. Sure. And so obviously, you know, there are some specific motivations that parents have in terms of the progression toward homeschooling. They want to be there, they feel as though they can be the more appropriate uh, teachers for sure. their children. But when you start uh, addressing some of those specific issues within families, that then impacts the entire view of the homeschooling network, even sure. though some are operating without those negatives associated with them. Sure. So what I'd like for us to do is to talk about some of those issues, how are they being addressed, because I think that's really very important so that we can then have a positive view on how homeschool students in the state of Texas are progressing. So thank you so very, very much. We'll be right back, so please stay with us. HCC's online college is officially open. This not only means online classes, but also online degrees and certificates. You can now credential up anytime, anywhere. Join the fast-growing number of students getting their full college education from anywhere they use a laptop. HCC currently offers 32 fully online degrees and will offer 71 next year. You no longer have to find a way or time to get to college. HCC brings college to you. Welcome back to Credential Up Houston. We are focusing today on homeschooling. We have P16 directors in our audience today who will ask questions during our fourth segment. But right now, we are talking to two of our very distinguished guests who have joined us, Mr. Tim Lambert and Mr. Jeremy Newman from the Texas Coalition for Homeschooling. So thank you so much for being with us. And during the last segment, uh, Mr. Lambert, you made reference to some of the concerns that were raised at the national conference, one of them being safety. Has sure. that been an issue in the state of Texas? Uh, it, it is to some degree. And I think, uh, you know, I was quoted in some national news stories after the Florida school shootings because we saw a dramatic increase in our inquiries about homeschooling from parents who were concerned about safety issues. So we do see families that are contacted by CPS about con uh, safety issues. But we've also seen uh, families who are concerned in the public school setting about issues related to safety. So uh, one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons that parents often choose to homeschool is because they are concerned may, not just about academic issues, but they're concerned for safety issues of their children. Okay, so as you look at the entire network, that coalition, 
uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Newman, and your interaction with them, particularly as you focus on policy issues. In your interactions, have you found that conversation to emerge as well? Yeah, I mean, I've had that conversation many times. And if you look at the, the polling that's been done to try and figure out what, what issues are the things that are most compelling as a reason for families to choose to homeschool, um, on most polls it shows up as the third or fourth most common reason as a single factor where parents say, this is the reason that I chose to homeschool. And then for a large percentage of others, it's often the, you know, kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back where they're considering it and then something happens um, you know, at their local school or something makes the national headlines and they just think, okay, that's, that's it, it's time. Okay, I see what you're saying. And then of course, as you look at the other side, there have been some cases as well where perhaps some of the parents who are homeschooling might have some question mark as well. Right. So how do you address that since it's not regulated by the state? So how is that addressed? Well, it's, it's a, a multifaceted point because sure. on, on the one hand, you have people saying, well, you know, how do we make sure that kids are protected unless we're in the home all the time and we have someone besides the parents who can see these children and make sure they're okay? And so there's kind of a, a presumption, that argument, against the family to begin with. But then you have to go look at the data to figure out whether or not that's legitimate right. and it's based on anything. And the data actually shows pretty clearly that issues of, of abuse and things like that are less common among homeschoolers than among the general population. And so just from that perspective, it automatically kind of raises questions about the, the policy implications of trying to uh, address these problems. And then you also have to look kind of at, at the alternatives, like is your solution actually solving a problem? Because you know, having someone come into the house once a year or twice a year or something like that, it, who is that going to help? And so those are the types of questions you have to ask. And when you're talking about you know, invading uh, and regulating all of these families to, to try and catch a few people who your solution might not even identify, it's kind of a high price to pay. I see what you're saying. So what is the prevalence of homeschooling in Houston, for example, and in the state of Texas? Um, home, we, we think home, Texas is one of the, the largest homeschool states. We, of course, there are no hard numbers because there's no uh, registration required, but we estimate well over 300,000 homeschool students in Texas. In fact, there are more homeschool students in Texas than in traditional private schools. And uh, that is because we have a lot of freedom here and parents, there's a, a huge uh, support network, uh, lots of opportunities from uh, academics and uh, all, all the way up to uh, extracurricular activities. So that number continues to grow. Sure, I was looking at some of the state law requirements mm -hmm. for homeschool students. And one of them is that the state law requires that a school, regardless of type, must teach reading, spelling, grammar, mathematics, and good citizenship. Now that's really important. So let's say if a parent doesn't have the credentials to teach in either of those areas, what is the provision made to support the students, as an example, in that area? Mr. Newman? Yeah, so there, there are a lot of different options. So the one interesting thing to note first, actually, is that you know most parents who are teaching their kids didn't major in you know, one of those five, or certainly all, all of those why. different, uh, all of those different subjects. But the interesting thing is that statistically, actually, the education level of the parent does not correlate to the success of the student. So whether the parent has, you know, a PhD or whether they have just a, co a basic college education or even no college education at all, that doesn't statistically show up in the results for the student. So that's one of the most interesting things. But then um, beyond that, in Texas especially, and in a lot of other states, there's a really a community-based effort um, that you can tap into where you have homeschool co-ops, which in, in Texas are really, really prevalent, where basically a community of parents will get together and they'll do classes once or twice a week or you know, three times a week, something like that. And parents who have expertise in certain subject matter will focus on that subject matter. And then you know, during the rest of the week, the, the kids learn from home. I've seen data also to indicate the success rates of students who are who are homeschooled and obviously you are very successful uh, as well do you have data to indicate the numbers of homeschool students for example who are placed in uh, very high level high performing jobs 
uh, in Texas and, of course, nationally as well. We don't we don't have that kind of specific data. Uh, I mean, from a uh, a long-term standpoint, homeschooling is still a relatively new phenomenon. Right. But we do have some data that indicates that homeschoolers who go to college graduate at a 74 percent rate compared to about 49 percent of the general public. So uh, a lot of the data that we do have indicates that homeschoolers are very well uh, represented academically but also socially and part of that is indicated by the fact that many many colleges are now recruiting homeschool students because they see them as, as terrific uh, students. Yes, of course, and of course I saw as well that the success rates are really very high, yes, yes. which is really uh, commendable because of the structure that you have established for the homeschool students. What we're going to do is to talk about the matriculation process because in doing a bit of research, I found that there are many prestigious four-year institutions that are accepting homeschool students into their programs as well. So we'll talk about that in just a moment, and we'll be right back. HCC, so many classes, so little tuition. Register today at hccs.edu slash now. I learned how to cook from my grandmother in the mountains of Oaxaca. I have won many awards and worked in many restaurants. HCC was a turning point in my life. What those wonderful teachers and instructors taught me is priceless. Welcome back to Potential Up. Houston, we are talking about homeschooling today. And one of the interesting points made is that, from Mr. Lambert and Mr. Newman, that homeschooling is not regulated by the Texas Education Agency, as it were, but there is, of course, a Te Texas Education Code right. that addresses it. So please address that for us, please. Sure, so uh, in the course of the 1980s, the state was uh, trying to say that homeschoolers were not legitimate. We won, uh, we dealt with that in the Leaper versus Arlington case, as we already discussed. But after that, many of the state colleges were saying they did not uh, accept a homeschool graduate as a high school graduate. And the legislature addressed that in 2003 when they amended the education code relative to college admission to say that the state of Texas views a, a, a graduate of a non-traditional secondary school, including a home school, to be equivalent to a public high school graduate. So today, state-supported institutions of higher education have to accept a homeschool graduate as a high school graduate. And then, of course, all those other uh, entry requirements for that institution apply. So that was, uh, we were very happy to see that because in our view, uh, homeschoolers were being uh, judged based on a, a process rather than on what their academic ability were. And there are homeschool students who've gone on to Harvard University, sure. Cornell, some are enrolling at Rice University, yeah. Haverford, and various other institutions uh, as well. So talk just a little bit about some of those students and their progression and the college admissions process that is sure. followed. Mr. Newman? Sure, yeah, so I mean, there. in fact, you can just Google it, you know, examples of high profile oh, homeschoolers yes. and you'll see the list um, it's, it's a surprisingly long one, and uh, yeah, there's actually an example I can I can give you from our legislative team, which ev every legislative session, you know, we'll recruit interns to come and work on the legislative team, and uh, one of the interns that worked with us from 2015 was just accepted to Harvard University for law school, so he's going there now. He's interested in being a judge at some point, and uh, I think you know one of the reasons that homeschoolers statistically do well in college is because homeschooling really teaches you to be self-governing. Right? You have to be on top of your work all of the time. And once you get to college, that's an asset that really helps you a lot. And so one of the things that we did in Texas was to amend the education code to ensure that homeschoolers who are trying to get into college are treated the same way as other students. And specifically, the education code requires that the colleges see homeschool graduates as equivalent to public school graduates. And uh, then we actually went back and amended that in 2017 as well to make sure that issues like class rank and things like that weren't, uh, you know, weren't disproportionately affecting homeschool students. So there's some things like that that we've gone back to tweak, but overall it's been 
a really positive experience, I think, for homeschoolers getting into college. And as you mentioned before, a lot of colleges are specifically recruiting homeschool students now because they see how well they perform. So for the homeschool completers in Houston and the state of Texas, which institutions are they going to primarily? Are they going to a lot of the institutions in the state of Texas or in their local communities? Yeah, I think I think all of them. You all know, of them. Uh, yes. So we've seen uh, we've seen some uh, state institutions become uh, more accepting of homeschoolers earlier. But um, w one of my favorite stories. This is probably from ten or fifteen years ago. One of our board members had a daughter who graduated, made an application at Rice University and a, an application at University of Houston. And Rice came back and said, well, you have to do some other requirements because you're a homeschool graduate. And the dad wrote a letter and said, you know, we think we're going to go to the University of Houston. Thank you very much. And so later, Rice amended their admission policy. So I think that's kind of indicative of what has happened. So there are very few institutions that we're aware of today that, that uh, restrict the right of a homeschooler to make an application. And many of the, the homeschool students are enrolled in dual credit programs sure. uh, as well. And so that partnership requires what in the, part, in the process? What do the students have to present, for example? Mr. Newman. Well, so yeah, so a lot of homeschool students go do, do dual credit classes, and it's, it's a number of different types of things. They also do CLEP classes and things like that. It's a really common practice for homeschoolers to basically use you know, the last half of their high school education to try and get a head start on college. So we amended the education code on this issue actually as well um, to basically say the local college has to accept a homeschool student according to the same criteria as they would any public school sure. student. You have a, quite a network also in the Woodlands as I understand it. We do. So tell us about that. Well we have one of our, we do two statewide conferences every year and one of them is in the Woodlands. So uh, we have about 5,000 homeschoolers that will come to this conference and it's, it's kind of like an in-training for the parents. We have uh, different workshops and stuff they can learn about homeschooling and different aspects of learning. Uh, curriculum providers are there to sell curriculum and we even have a, a program for teens and for uh, young students. So it's really kind of an exciting time in the summer to come together and uh, get some education about what's going to happen and get cranked up for the fall. Okay, and of course according to all of the, the documents that we read about student success, that student engagement is really critically uh, important. So that provides an opportunity for that component of it. And some have asked, well, what about athletics? What about the daily routine that the homeschool students have that would not only provide the academics, but that social engagement as well with others? Mr. Newman. Yeah, so I mean, I can speak to this having been homeschooled myself, that it, frankly, in Texas, it almost depends on where you live. Uh, and uh, in, in a lot of the metropolitan areas, there are a lot of activities you can participate in. They're not always affordable because they're, you know, they're private options and you know, they're, they're there to, to make money in some cases. And uh, then in the, the rural areas, sometimes you don't have enough people, homeschool students in the community, to put something like that together. So the, the socialization issue in general hasn't really been a problem because there's, there's pretty much always community. There might not be a big enough community in some areas to put organized sports or something like that together. But when it comes to those types of issues, um, you know, that's something that we've actually been trying to work on through legislation. Well, very, very good. Well, I, we are going to take a break and we are going to go to the audience next and hear their questions as well. So please. HCC's online college is officially open. This not only means online classes, but also online degrees and certificates. You can now credential up anytime, anywhere. Join the fast-growing number of students getting their full college education from anywhere they use a laptop. HCC currently offers 32 fully online degrees and will offer 71 next year. You no longer have to find a way or time to get to college. HCC brings college to you. Welcome back to Credential Up Houston. We will now go to our P16 directors who are in the audience and Frank Cooper, who will ask some questions. Frank. Thank you, Dr. Ford Fisher. Well, we have a question uh, from Lillian. She's gonna ask about HCC Online Do Credit. 
Thank you. All right. What are the opportunities for students to enroll at HEC dual credit and online? So, uh, I mean, dual credit especially is something that a lot of homeschool students use, and doing it through HCC is certainly an option that any homeschool student in the, the area has. And then, uh, in fact, I think you were telling me that HCC has 32 different online associate degree programs that they offer. So a lot of homeschool students pr you know, try and find non-traditional routes that they can use to go through college, and dual credit is definitely one of those because you can obviously do it during high school, that's the point. And then online school, um, so like you're talking about through HCC, is something that a lot of homeschoolers use because it provides a lot of flexibility. And uh, there are obviously a lot of options through HCC locally. And then I know a lot of homeschool students who go to you know, colleges out of state uh, online and all sorts of things like that. So there's really a plethora of options uh, through the local colleges or online that any homeschooler can pursue. We have a question from Patricia. She also has a question regarding uh, homeschool. Yes, thank you. Can homeschool students graduate from college and teach in public schools? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, homeschoolers are treated just like everybody else, public high school students, when it comes to college admission. And you were just telling us about the program you just guys just launched with 32 degrees and your connection with Texas A&M so they can make that transfer. So those kinds of things make it really uh, available and easy for homeschool students to get that college education. And then, of course, they can teach uh, any place in a public high school or pursue any other uh, uh, degree or activity that any other student could. One of the things that we are focusing on is the 60 by 30 uh, as well, to meet that standard from the state to ensure that by 2030, 60% of the residents in our state have an associate's degree or a baccalaureate degree, et cetera, and that they're able to add value in the workforce. So that's really critically important. So we'd like to get closing comments from you. Let's start with you, Mr. Newman, and we'll conclude with Mr. Lambert. Yeah, I actually think that one of the ways that you accomplish that is, you mentioned earlier that homeschool students can yeah, they, they perform much better in college often and that more of them go to college. And one of the things that we've been working on is trying to eliminate barriers for families who have difficulty moving into the homeschool environment where they can pursue some of those options that are more difficult for them otherwise. So you know, we talked earlier about extracurricular activities, things like that that a lot of other states offer that we're trying to solve, um, or you know, financial difficulties that, that students have where they, you know, they're paying the school taxes but then they also have to pay for their own students. So there are policy issues like that that a lot of uh, families talk about that we've been looking into as solutions to try and let people make that transition more easily. Thank you so much for that. Mr. Lambert? Well, you know, it, uh, having been on the uh, early days of homeschooling in Texas, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be on this side where we've gone from, uh, you know, opposition to homeschooling to support of homeschooling. Of course, we like to point to Texas as uh, one of the light bearers across the nation. So. It's exciting to see the freedom that people have and the work that groups like your organization is doing to make those opportunities available for all students, including homeschoolers. Well, thank you so very much. I thank you both so very much. And that, of course, is one of the mission statements within the Houston Community College is that we are an access point for all of the residents of our community to get an educational credential and then to contribute to the workforce. So we are accessible, we are affordable, and of course we are flexible as well, and 24-7 with the 32 fully online programs. Well, to Mr. Tim Lambert and Mr. Jeremy Newman of the Texas Homeschool Coalition, we cannot thank you enough. We really appreciate your being here and sharing information, and we'd like to thank our guests who are part of the audience as well, our P16 directors. And so with this, I would like to say that lifelong learning is really very important. Houston Community College is here to serve you. So we ask that you will make it a priority to credential up. Thank you for joining us.